All right, what a bunch, what a bunch. This is, first of all, I wanna thank iConnections for the inaugural MENA panel at the Global Alt 2024. So we're really excited to be here today and I, of all of the people that could have come to share the story of what's happening in the part of the region that might be one of the most talked about and exciting transformations, it's on everyone's mind. You hear about AI and you hear about the Middle East. I brought this group that we have here with us. So, um, Arij is the Managing Director and Fund Manager of Al Waha Bahrain Development Bank's Fund of Funds. We have Yasser Mustafa, who is the Chief Executive Officer of National Bank of Kuwait's Capital Partners and a member of the Investment Committee. Sami Kamel, the Chief Executive Officer of Dutco Cleantech out of the UAE. Yusuf Khalili, the Chief Commercial Officer of Autonomous, the the, uh, oh, I don't know, whatever you guys are doing in the future over there at Autonomous Neom, and of course, Arvind Ramamurthy, who is the chief, um, you're the chief market, the advisor to the chairman and the chief of market development at Abu Dhabi's general market, at ADGM. So, you guys, we have, we have Middle East on everyone's mind. We know that our sovereign wealth funds comprise nearly $7 trillion. We have a private investment mandate global liquidity pools that are powering the world's digital age that we're going to hear about. The name of the game for the region's investors is economic diversification. You're here to help us understand how these exponential technologies and the advent of the extension of these global economies are going to help us put the Middle East on the map. Now, that was a lot, and you guys all just flew in, so you're in the Miami sunshine. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Miami and Global Alts. Um, Arij, I think I want to start with you. Right. Because one of, the, one of the most interesting things, I think, is really looking at how um, investment and economic development strategies are happening like at the sovereign level and then all across the sort of GP fundraising chain in the region. What are you looking at? And what are the, what are the types of partnerships and investments that you look at? Um, so I think what we've started to do, or I think we've been doing for quite some time in Bahrain, is looking at how we can you know, back different GPs that can have some kind of strategic um, you know, give back to Bahrain. Um, whether it's helping to support our you know, startup ecosystem from a technology perspective, but then even from our economic diversification, we have various different sectors that we're looking at, healthcare, tourism, and manufacturing. So um, on my level um, at the Fund of Funds, we focus very much on technology uh, funds that are looking to invest or to do some kind of support into the region. So we started back in 2018, and we've started to see that it's actually been very helpful to, to support our local ecosystem and even get some of our companies to learn how to cross markets and grow out of MENA mm -hmm. um, and kind of learn from the different playbooks that you know, some of these GPs have invested in. You have, you have something to say about that, Yasser. You're sitting on a, on a solid PE background in one of the most talked about cities in the world. Yeah, so based out of Dubai, we invest directly within the region, in the Middle East region, which we define as the GCC as far north as Turkey uh, and as far west as North Africa. I, I think to, to borrow a phrase, and, and, and the message I would give to the audience here, is you may not be interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is interested in you. Mm. And, and I think you need a Middle East strategy and a view on the Middle East, and whether that's touching it from traditional geopolitics to taking capital from the GCC to investing in the GCC like we do, um, there is a number of trends that suggest that you can't ignore the region much longer or any longer for that matter. Hmm. Um, we've been able to invest over you know, 15 years. We have been lucky enough to secure investments from US family offices and US institutional investors, and we only see that activity growing because it's such a small allocation of global books, not just US uh, investors, but European and Asian as well. So we see, obviously, there are challenges in the region. I'm sure we'll touch on that. But uh, there are tremendous opportunities for the educated investor. So yeah, that's really interesting. This is, I think, for everyone. What's changing when you talk about opening that sort of bi-directional capital flow? What's changing in that investor profile? And what are you seeing? I'm sure you're seeing it from you know, Bahrain and through the rest of the Gulf quite, quite extensively. So, um, first of all, Datko Group, we uh, were a family-owned uh, office uh, in Dubai, 
Uh, we make direct investments uh, across different verticals globally, but also in the region. Um, to answer your question, what were you seeing different? It's, it's the, I would say on the energy side, on the clean tech side, the region historically has been known as a uh, major source of hydrocarbons, be it crude, crude oil or uh, natural gas. However, with the climate change discussions and all the, uh, the dynamics around the energy transition, we're starting to see in the past, I would say five years, a, uh, the creation of a new segment of investment opportunities within the clean tech space. Uh, that was, I would say, first created by regulatory frameworks introduced by governments. It started by um, uh, governments announcing uh, uh, zero uh, uh, emissions targets for uh, net zero targets for around 2050 plus or minus. Uh, and then that's cascading down to the regulatory frameworks that are being introduced to incentivize investments in the clean tech space and renewables. Uh, so you have programs introduced around IPP programs. You can sign up 20-year PPA with an off-taker, uh, a state utility, and you do a large-scale wind project or a solar plant. Right. Energy efficiency also getting a good share both on the demand side and the supply side, energy efficiency investments, uh, triggered by, again, regulatory incentives offered by the governments. Um, and then also waste to energy is another segment we're seeing where there are investments happening at the project level. Um, and then most recently, uh, we started to see the monetization of uh, solar and wind uh, energy mo uh, molecules right. to convert into green hydrogen and then converting that into green ammonia, putting it on ships and then exporting it to Japan and Korea uh, to decarbonize the coal-fired power plants there. So. From Sammy onward, you get to the sort of Star Trek medicine's future quantum space plans for the Middle East that you hear about all the time. I think that, and Sammy has a really strong and very um, prominent thesis around the world about how the region is really diversifying when you talk about that, you know, the evolution of a, uh, the hydrocarbon-based economy. Yep. Before we get to the future, I want to talk about the, you know, what's happening in the change of investor profiles and in, in, in the established ecosystem, from startups to investments to frameworks? So if we look at what's happened with us, if you look back at our funds, and again, just very quickly, by background, it's private equity, private credit, and real estate private equity focus on the region. 18 years ago, 17 years ago, when we started this business, it was largely Middle East investors, and it was historically Middle East family offices. That business, if you fast forward to today, and the evolution that's happened, and there's a number of reasons for that, and, and as you said, we'll get into it at some point, that evolution has now become more of US family offices, international family offices, and then the big swing, and I have to give credit to this regional sovereign wealth funds, so the sovereign wealth funds in Saudi Arabia, and in Abu Dhabi, and in other parts of the region, that decided we need to turn around and invest in our own region. We've been securing returns from all over the world, but now it's time to invest back. And that was sort of the big bang event, I would call, for our business. That's when we took sort of a step function and other asset managers in the region, not just me, not just us, um, to uh, take that level of focus and the level of returns because once those government-backed entities turned around and said, we are going to do whatever we can to secure foreign direct investment mm. and make that a successful slash pleasant experience as much as possible for those investors who come in. It improved our returns, and it improved the profile of our business when compared to other businesses internationally and for, and for international investors to come in. And if I could just maybe add to that as well. Yeah. So from an Abu Dhabi perspective, it's not like investing is new to us, right? I mean, Adia has been around for over 50 years. The Mubadala has been around for over 30 years. So you know, investing in global opportunities is something that's embedded. What we are seeing in terms of capital flows to your question, right? One is we are seeing investments happening in the region more so. So, you know, in my previous role at Adnoc, we actually brought in a couple of pipeline deals where we brought in global investors to actually invest into Abu Dhabi and into the UAE. Um, that's one trend that we're seeing. The second trend we're seeing is, you know, as the family offices from the region get more sophisticated, right, they're looking for opportunities as well. You know, historically, these family offices would invest typically in equities or real estate. Right? And now they diversify. So what you are seeing is both. So you're seeing investors from, from within, the sovereign wealth funds, yeah. invest globally, but also, to Yasser's point, invest locally. You're seeing family offices that are getting more and more sophisticated. 
and looking for investments. And the third thing is given just the growth and the stability that we've enjoyed, mm -hmm. uh, at least within the GCC, uh, that has led to tremendous economic opportunities for people to come and invest within the region as well. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing all those trends happening right now. So you, it, that brings up a really interesting point. I, I want to stay here for a minute because something that I noticed when uh, we were putting you know, our, this group together was the interest and the, the, the lack of or the, the opportunity for exposure. We know that we've, and we, we've seen these names for a very long time, we have very long established relationships with Goldman and Blackstone and the people who've helped us really develop you know, our position in the 20th and 21st centuries. What, are you, what I'm seeing here in the United States is that there's a lot more opportunity at different tiers of investment profiles. What are you seeing on the ground? And, and by the way, for this Middle Eastern bunch, we are a rowdy, we are not a monolithic block. We are a diverse, feisty, opinionated group of nations that are a mosaic and a very, very different kind of fabric of weaving of different cultures and opinions. So this is probably the quietest you're gonna see the five of us all week. But for all of you, um, and they're not, really, they're not really quiet, they've all got opinions and I want them to unleash them. If, if you were an, a, you know, a foreign allocator, if you were a foreign manager and you're looking to establish your presence and put boots on the ground, and make your mark in the region. What are you looking at? And what is happening at the regulatory level, the sovereign level, the fund level that's attracting you? Where are we going with this? What's new? So maybe I mean, I'll take that one. Okay. Right? So I think, I mean, as ADGM, now we've been the fastest growing financial district in the region for the last couple of years, right? We've pretty much doubled on most metrics over the last two years. I think there are a few kind of broad themes that are playing out, right? One is clearly, you know, the region is more attractive, right, to invest. Don't forget, you've got, you've got a wonderful demographic in the region today, right? You've got young populations. <clears throat> you've got economic growth, uh, which is also government-backed, so there's a significant amount of investments that governments across the region are doing. You've got fantastic infrastructure. Uh, you've got great rule of law. So you've got, you've got a bunch of things that are working well. And then you add to it quality of life, right? Uh, you know, today the quality of life in the region potentially can compete with any other part of the world. So you add all of that together, it makes it very compelling yeah. uh, you know, for these foreign players to come and set up uh, in the region. Right. And then you add to it the regulatory landscape. Uh, I would argue today as, as EDGM, and maybe I'm biased, but you know, we are probably the most progressive regulator out there, right? Uh, on definitely matters such as fund management, et cetera, uh, because we've got direct application of common law. Uh, you know, we're really good, but what we, pride ourselves are, is in the new age stuff, right? So whether it's FinTech, whether it's you know, digital assets, whether it's uh, climate finance, we kind of lead the pack, uh, not just regionally, but probably in some instances globally. Uh, and I think a combination of that, so you've, you're open to business, you've got great quality of life, you've got the regulatory frameworks, and don't forget, you've got the wallet, right? The region's always had the wallet. Uh, and now we've got new pools of capital coming in as family offices. Do, do you Huge see that in the startup and venture ecosystems? What are you seeing, what are you seeing when you, know, you have that sort of foreign capital meets local pipeline? What's happening there? I mean, I think um, when people are kind of looking at the region, and so a lot of times when people are saying, like, you know, we want to come, we want to raise capital, um, and then, you know, they're kind of knocking on the doors of all of, like, the countries that are represented here. Um, I always tell them, you need to come and spend some time. Hmm. And yes, like all the information is there, and then you know you have wonderful conferences like these that are also being hosted in either Abu Dhabi or in you know the Dubai, Saudi, you know Bahrain, um, and I think everyone starts to say, oh, there's like friendly competition between all this. We're all trying to attract uh, foreign direct investment. We're all trying to focus, but you know, to your point, I think each one of us kind of complements each other. Um, if I speak about Bahrain, we've had a long-standing, very strong regulatory framework. Um, and it's all onshore, so there's no like offshore license and this and that. So it makes it very easy for a company, for example, that's in financial services to come and you know, springboard out of Bahrain. I'm not saying that you know, you're gonna stay there, but then you, know, you kind of build your, you know, um, your company, test the region, and then kind of move over. You move over very easily to Saudi Arabia, you go to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, et cetera, and then it makes it very easy from like a startup perspective because you, know, you have, obviously have to be conscious of your costs and everything right. um, when you're at the beginning. I think also for kind of larger uh, companies, you have, you know, and I'm not gonna speak on behalf of my you know, peers here, but each, 
each country and jurisdiction offers something back to whether you're a healthcare company, whether you're an energy company, whether you're in logistics or tourism. And I think it's like a beautiful story. Um, but I think the best way for any investor is to come and spend a few days. Um, you know, it, it makes it very easy for you to hop over, whether you're driving, the flights, connectivity is very um, seamless when you're in the region. Mm. Um, that's why we're all here and not that jet lagged, you know, because there's a direct flight. Direct everywhere. flight. Um, and then, you know, spend some time, get to know the people, and then you can make a better kind of informed decision as to, you know, what suits what you're trying to offer. And there's something for everyone. And we have so much potential. And then some people say, oh, but you know, this is going to take over Bahrain or this is going to take over Saudi or Kuwait. And I think we're still pretty early that there's enough room for all of us and still more. And I think that's what's beautiful about the region um, that a lot of people don't get to see on TV, for example. That's right. And I think in terms of what's new and in the region, we have, we have a new kid on the block. Saudi Arabia's uh, NEOM projects, Yusuf, are in the news, are on the forefront of everyone's mind. And you're coming up quick. It's a newly established, relatively newly established, enterprise within NEOM called Tonomous. So when we talk about the future and we talk about the new ecosystem, we can't miss the chance to talk about what's going on over there in NEOM with 2030. What's going on? It's hot. It's, it's amazing what's happening. First of all, um, my twist is going to be mostly around technology because NEOM is going to be the first cognitive, sustainable city in the world. It's a mega, giga city. It's the size of Belgium, so it's not really a, a small city. But what's happening is, echoing what my colleagues here said, we're open for business. The region is open for business. Saudi um, is, is definitely has been reforming a lot of its policies and about you know, how to attract investors. And if you've heard anything about Vision 2030, um, that's uh, our, um, uh, His Highness the Crown Prince is leading, basically says that a lot is going to happen across all sectors. But in technology specifically, where NEOM kind of belongs as a future, defining the future of living, um, get, get this. So technology and digital economy is going to contribute 20% of the GDP. Um, in terms, of, in terms of the direct uh, investment uh, that's expected within that, 25 billion is targeted within 2030. Um, 35 billion is the size of the AI spend expected in the kingdom in the next three years. Out of that, around 2.5 billion just around generative AI, which is just a new thing. Um, now, so there's a lot happening in terms of demand. So the, the region and the country specifically is very hungry for those startups, those innovative technology companies to come to the region. So the message here is if you are, if within your portfolio any of those companies are interested to do business, come talk to us because we're, we're hungry for those technologies to come and there's a huge demand for them in the region. Now two things are challenging. What does that look like? And this is, I think, for all of you. When we're talking about moving away from you know, these sort of very established industries, I think, that we're known for, we're obviously you know, a petroleum uh, exporter. We are obviously established in real estate. I think everyone here has yeah. you know, very traditional you know, sort of portfolio. And we're talking about this kind of transition. What does it look like when you say, you know, come, come talk to us? What are you guys looking for? So we're, we're, looking, we're looking at, so when we bring those startups, so, so think of this. So customers want the new technologies. There is Tonomous here, the company I work for, which is owned by Neom, which is owned by the Sovereign Fund of Saudi Arabia, which is the largest kind of technology AI cognitive solutions company now in the kingdom and in the region, I would, I would claim. So it looks like we would like companies to come and be part of the portfolio we're offering. We're, 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 we've pledged 1.5 billion in terms of venture capital you know, to be invested over the next five years. Uh, we're open for co-investments together in the, in the startups, whereby we're going to offer those services to the um, customers. But Mona, what I was about to say is there are two things that needed to happen before Saudi could attract such investments in technology. One, in terms of the regulatory framework, um, we were very happy to see that over the last few years, we have now the data and privacy law in place. We have the cybersecurity law in place. We have the IoT law in place. And all of those governing frameworks are there to ensure that you know, international players are going to be 
you know, transacting safely and you know, protecting the privacy of their data and our, our customers' data. But right. more importantly, talent. Talent. So talent, there was a huge gap for, for all of this to happen in Saudi. We had to look at talent. So over the last seven years, and you speak about the future, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the past because we cannot reach the future without having worked on the past. Over the last seven years, less than 15,000 people were actually in the IT sector, in the digital economy IT sector. Today, we're at more than 100, 350,000 people. That didn't come from vacuum. That happened through a lot of programs in terms of upskilling the local workforce. 7% women, 35% women today. Um, 20,000 people being trained as we speak, just in the next six months, 20,000 people on AI and Gen AI. Uh, we as Tonomous developed our own Arabic LLM model. We claim it's the best, and we claim it's, you know, it's going to be open, it's going to work with all the other LLMs. We have our own technologies, digital twin, metaverse, blockchain, data mesh, uh, computer vision, IoT. So this is IP. Here you're seeing a difference. You're not seeing a company in the Middle East um, importing or being a reseller of technology. Mm. You're talking about you know, reversing the tables and saying, okay, flipping the tables and saying, we are actually an exporter. So the vision for autonomous is to actually be, you know, the, the next big tech company on the block. So we're, we're working on this and then I'm inviting again all, all the managers and all the startups that are within those portfolios to come and talk to us. Sammy, that's, that's aligned with your thesis with how you're looking at, you know, the liquid sunshine future of the Arab world. What are you, what are you seeing in your industry? Uh, so, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, the region has uh, very promising uh, resources when it comes to solar and wind, especially wind, because wind uh, energy plays a big role in the uh, cost of production of green hydrogen, which is the new type of energy molecule that's coming out, out from the region. Right. Um, Several of the governments in the region want to continue to, to play a leading role in exporting energy in different shapes and forms beyond the hydrocarbons, the traditional hydrocarbons. So uh, as you mentioned, the, the liquid sun, which is basically converting green hydrogen to green ammonia and shipping it to uh, North Asia, for example, in Japan and Korea, they will use green ammonia to decarbonize their coal fire power plants. Several, at least uh, 40 projects announced in the region so far, uh, green, plant, uh, green hydrogen, green ammonia plants, uh, Two, three billion dollars plus each project. Uh, we're seeing uh, infrastructure funds coming to the region from the US, from Europe, right. uh, with interest in investing in these projects. These projects are typically linked to 20 year offtake, 15 years offtake agreements with the buyers. Right. So uh, lenders love these type of projects. Uh, and that's, I would say, a new segment, back to Yasser's point, around new type of investors, new type of capital coming into the region that historically. Uh, wasn't looking for these type of projects. Uh, so uh, decarbonization infrastructure funds. Right. I would say these are the new players we're more and more seeing now in the region as a result of the emergence of these uh, multi-billion uh, clean energy projects. You're seeing that. You're nodding your head in agreement here, Yasser. Hey, well, l listen, I, I, I think overall, you know, we, we, we've touched upon this. I mean, I think that if, if you think about stats, emerging markets is a big term. Obviously, we're included in emerging markets. Middle East is a big term. Yeah. It's not monolithic. The opportunities in the GCC are different than the opportunities in North Africa, are different than the opportunities in Jordan, Lebanon, are different than the opportunities in Turkey. But if you follow that adage from Wayne Gretzky that you skate to where the puck's going to be, if you look at our private capital participation as a percentage of GDP today, we being our being Middle East, it's where China and India were in the 90s. There's only one direction that's going. It's going to increase. It's going to grow. And that's where the opportunities are. Competition is a little bit less, a, a lot less than where you'll find in other developed markets. If you have the right people, the right whether you're going boots on the ground yourself or you're investing in, in managers, uh, there are opportunities 100% to, to play a role and, and play in the growth of, of this region. And speaking of opportunities, if I may, I, would, I, would, I want to make a bet with everybody that in three years, this part of the world is going to come to Middle East to look for talent because we're spending a lot of money on upscaling people and our local talent is going to be a very good competitive asset for us 
but also to be accessible without restrictions. And you see a lot of restrictions happening in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. The Middle East is open for business. So um, I would invite everybody to come and look at the local talent. Well, you guys, I have a million more questions, but we're sadly going to have to wrap it up. But the last thing to close this all out, this is an exciting vision, not just for the region, but I think for the future of the global economy, the idea that you have an active, a region that's actively participating in sort of creating that radical extension of not just marketplaces, but really like human thriving is amazing. And none of it happens unless we have those frameworks. So Arvind, bring us home and tell us what exactly, where are we? It, you know, for someone who's first time, and where are we going? What's on the ground that's going to you know, bring these people to come spend a few days, as Arij is saying? Come think, get to know us. I think the panel members kind of captured it really well, right? which is fundamentally, the region is open for business. Right? Uh, we're extremely investor friendly, very business friendly, very forward thinking. Uh, you know, talent wants to come to the region increasingly. Uh, you know, we've got some fantastic programs to bring talent. We've got great educational institutions. You've got amazing healthcare facilities, right? Great quality of life. So you've got all of that stuff playing out. In terms of regulatory frameworks, uh, you know, we've got, I mean, if I can speak from an ADGM perspective, uh, you know, we've got direct application of common law, as I said. Uh, you know, we have, I mean, probably best in class frameworks, you know, whether it's asset management, whether it's venture capital, whether it's uh, digital assets, whether it's climate finance, and go on. Uh, we, in fact, even have a tech lab and a reg lab, right? within our ecosystem. So I think what you're seeing increasingly, and this is not just Abu Dhabi, but across the region, is, is that mentality of being open for business. Uh, does that lead to healthy competition? 100% yes. Uh, is that good for the region? 100% yes. Yeah, for sure. Because I think fundamentally the view is none of us here are looking to split a pie. I think it's basically growing, growing the pie the together. Pie. Exactly. And I think you know, we invite everyone here to come and experience it because it's something very, very different. And there's so much to see. <laughs> there's so, so much, much to, to see. see. Yeah. And you know, I, wanna, I want to take us home there. I want one thing. If, I can't wait for you to come see that part of the world. If there were one thing that we could share with all of them, let's just, what's one thing that you would share with everyone here about where we're from and about what they get to see when they come? Hospitality and warmth. Safety. I would say market fundamentals are very strong. Trust, trust. Doing business is all about trust. Shaking the hand is enough. I think last but not least, high quality of talent. High quality of talent. Thank you for your time. We hope to see you there soon.